Hi, Dr. Scott Cleos. I'm being joined by my daughter Juliana today, and today's video is on gadolinium contrast agents, basically what they are, how they work, and how they're handled in the body. Now, to understand how contrast agents really work in MR, you're going to have to be familiar with some basic concepts of NMR physics. If you need a little refresher, you can watch the first half of the video, MRI, Basic Physics, and Brief History on this same YouTube channel. Otherwise, for those who want to dive right in, here's a quick 60 second refresher. Remember when we put radio frequency energy into the protons of our body, two things happen. First, some of the protons flip into the higher energy state, and then they precess together to form a net magnetization oriented 90 degrees from the main magnetic field. As they fall back down to baseline, again, two things happen. The protons, all being positively charged, repel and move away from each other, become unsynchronized, and in the process destroy the transverse magnetization. This is referred to as T2 relaxation. Then the protons fall back to their baseline low energy state and regrow the longitudinal magnetization. This is the T1 relaxation. Things that are bright on a T1 weighted image regrow the longitudinal magnetization quickly. Bottom line, MRI contrast agents are designed to increase the T1 signal of an image by returning the protons to their baseline state more rapidly and quickly regrowing the longitudinal magnetization. The agent most commonly used for this purpose is the rare earth metal gadolinium. Gadolinium is a silvery white malleable and ductile metal with an atomic number of 64. On the periodic table, it's part of the lanthanide series classically listed at the bottom of the main table along with the actinide series to provide some symmetry to the table itself. The property that makes gadolinium an excellent contrast material is the fact that it is paramagnetic at body temperature. For brevity, we're not going to talk too much detail about magnetism in this particular video, but if you want some more information, we'd refer you to the video on magnetism and electron configurations on this same YouTube channel. Now. Going back to high school chemistry, the electron configuration of the neutral gadolinium atom is xenon, the prior noble gas, 4F7, 5D1, 6S2. Remember that the S subshell has a maximum of two electrons, D a maximum of 10, and F a maximum of 14. So you can see in gadolinium's outer or valence electrons, the S shell is completely filled. The D shell can hold nine more electrons, and the F shell is half full and can hold seven more electrons. These unpaired electrons in the F and D shell are what provide the magnetic characteristics of the gadolinium atom. So, when gadolinium contrast is injected into the bloodstream or joint capsule, the paramagnetic properties of the metal ion affect the local magnetic field and, more importantly, the relaxation of the hydrogen protons in the vicinity of the gadolinium. Specifically, the gadolinium causes the regional protons to fall back to their baseline low energy state quicker. And remember that the faster the longitudinal magnetization recovers, the stronger the T1 signal and the brighter that area appears on a T1 weighted image. For example, here are two T1 weighted images of the abdomen. Before gadolinium, all the vessels appear homogeneously gray and are difficult to see against the background of the normal regional soft tissues. Following gadolinium administration, the vessels now show up bright white as the gadolinium causes the protons in the blood to fall back quickly to their baseline state, recovering the longitudinal magnetization and producing a strong NMR signal on this T1 weighted image. However, the desired effect is dose limited. In fact, with enough gadolinium in the blood vessels or tissues, they can actually show up darker than the baseline on both T1 and T2 weighted images. The following images are from a classic paper by Elster et al. in 1990. This is a T1 weighted image through the urinary bladder showing three distinct contrast layers. Dark gray at the bottom, bright in the middle, and really dark at the top. These represent the areas of high, low and no concentration of gadolinium respectively. I think every radiology resident has seen these same exact images at some time during their training because you really don't see this anymore. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, an MR scan could take upwards of an hour to acquire. And in that time, the kidneys had enough time to excrete some of the gadolinium contrast and get this interesting layering effect that we see in these particular images. For comparison, here are the T2 weighted images through the same area, again showing really dark at the bottom, bright in the middle, and light gray at the top. But why is this? 
It's all in the physics. Here we took this series of eight test tubes and filled them with various concentrations of tap water and gadolinium contrast ranging from 0% gadolinium to 50% by volume. For instance, each tube is graduated and marked to 8 cc's. For the 50%, we simply put 4 cc's of gadolinium solution and 4 cc's of tap water. For the smaller concentrations, like 3.125%, we use this little tuberculin syringe filled with 0.25 cc's of gadolinium solution, then filled the rest of the tube up to the 8 cc mark with tap water. Not an exact science, but good enough for our little demonstration. We then put the filled tubes and plastic holders in the MR scanner and imaged the tubes with T1 and T2 sequences. These are the localizer, T1, and T2 sequences. Notice the maximum T1 signal is in the second test tube at 1.5%. At this concentration, the paramagnetic gadolinium atoms return the protons to their baseline state and produce a strong T1 signal. But these effects are dose limited and as the concentration of gadolinium goes up, we actually get the opposite effect. Going back to our T1 and T2 weighted images, you see after the second test tube, we actually start to lose T1 signal up until about the fifth test tube. After about 25% concentration by volume, we really don't see any signal at all. As the gadolinium concentration increases, the regional increasing magnetic effect causes the protons to move apart so fast that by the time we listen for the return signal, the transfer's magnetization is already gone. Even though it's a T1 weighted image, the T2 relaxation is so quick that it can actually destroy the signal before it's recorded. If we graph our results with gadolinium concentration on the x-axis and T1 signal on the y, the curve looks something like this. Up to this point, the T1 relaxation predominates and gives us a bright signal. However, as the gadolinium concentration increases, the T2 effects predominate and cause the signal to drop off. So looking back at our test tube experiment, you can see on the T2 line, the T2 signal drops off very rapidly. But again, for a T1 weighted image, we minimize the T2 effects by lowering our echo time. A short TE minimizes the T2 effects. A short TR maximizes the T1 effects. However, as the gadolinium concentration increases, the T2 shortening is so overwhelming that it can't be suppressed by the short echo time and you get no signal on the heavily T1 weighted image. So that basically describes the physics behind gadolinium contrast. The problem is gadolinium is a heavy metal and is quite toxic in the human body. One of the reasons it's so toxic is the fact that its most common cation, gadolinium plus 3, is about the same size as one of the most important metal cations in our body, calcium plus 2, both measuring about 0.99 angstroms in diameter. Remember, a cation is formed when atom, usually a metal or hydrogen, gives up one or more electrons and becomes positively charged. Again, the neutral gadolinium atom has an electron configuration of xenon, 4F7, 5D1, 6S2. The most common ion of gadolinium in a biologic system is gadolinium plus 3, where the two electrons in the 6S subshell and the single electron in the 5D subshell are given up, giving the atom its net plus 3 positive charge. The neutral calcium atom, on the other hand, has an electron configuration of argon, 4s2, and its ion, in biologic conditions, loses the two electrons in the 4s subshell, giving it its plus 2 net positive charge. Calcium is involved with many biological processes, including bony growth, blood clotting, nerve conduction, as well as skeletal muscle and heart contraction. Gadolinium ion competes with calcium in these biologic functions, and since it's more positive than calcium, can irreversibly bind to some of the organic molecules, deactivating their functions. The key to an effective contrast agent in MRI is to bind the gadolinium ion to a carrier molecule that allows it to circulate around the body and then be eliminated by normal renal or hepatic functions. This is done with the use of a chelating agent. Chelate comes from the Greek chile, which means claw, and we're going to see why in a moment. First, we want to review some chemistry and possibly introduce a few new terms. Remember when atoms come together to form stable molecules, they do so by completely filling their outer electron orbits, also known as valence electrons. This magic number of electrons is 8 for most atoms, 2 in the outer S subshell and 6 in the outer P subshell. 
The only exception is hydrogen, which only has a single S subshell and therefore only requires two electrons to be complete. So looking at a few simple molecules, methane has a chemical formula of CH4. The central carbon atom has four valence electrons and each of the hydrogen atoms has a single valence electron. When the hydrogen and carbon atoms come together, they share their valence electrons to make themselves complete. So at each point, the two shared electrons can simultaneously orbit either the hydrogen atom or the carbon atom, giving each hydrogen its requisite two valence electrons and the carbon atom its eight. Since both atoms are contributing a valence electron, this configuration is referred to as covalent bonding. Another example is the common water molecule H2O. Oxygen has six valence electrons, and the covalent bond with the two hydrogen atoms provides the complete two electrons per hydrogen and eight electrons for the oxygen atom. Metal ions, like gadolinium on the other hand, are very electron selfish and really don't like to share with any other atoms. However, they are more than willing to accept electrons from these same atoms. Fortunately, there are some atoms that are willing to participate, like the oxygen in our water molecule. First, for chelating metal ions, we can't really talk about valence electrons. Instead, we talk about coordinate sites, where the metal ion is willing to accept electrons from other atoms. Gadolinium has nine of these coordinates. Going back to our water molecule, the two free electrons on the negative side of our polar molecule off the oxygen atom can loosely bind to one of the coordinate sites and briefly share its electrons. This type of asymmetric sharing of electrons is referred to as coordinate covalent or dative covalent bonding and we'll represent it with this dotted arrow pointing towards the gadolinium ion. Unfortunately, the water molecules bind weakly to the coordinate sites and dissociate too rapidly to effectively clear the metal ion from the body. Fortunately, other atoms such as nitrogen with five valence electrons are also willing to share their electrons with gadolinium. There are two basic structures for chelating agents, linear and macrocyclic. The molecule DTPA, or pentetic acid, is a prototypical linear chelating agent consisting of a linear carbon and nitrogen backbone with five carboxyl limbs extending off of the backbone. Notice the negative charge associated with each of the carboxyl groups. This is the anion form of the molecule. Remember our binding rules require each atom to fill its valence orbitals for stability. Thus, each carbon atom has four, nitrogen three, oxygen two, and hydrogen one connection to other atoms to maintain stability and electrical neutrality. As drawn, the oxygen with the single bond to the carbon atom in each of the carboxyl groups seems to be missing one connection. What has happened is the hydrogen atom that was once connected to the oxygen has given up its electron to the oxygen and the positively charged hydrogen proton goes away. This converts the neutral carboxyl group to the negatively charged carboxylate or carboxylic acid. Since there are five carboxyl limbs, the molecule is called pentatic acid with a net molecular charge of minus five. Notice the two electrons in the oxygen which can now form dative bonds with the gadolinium ion. The gadolinium ion with its plus three charge is strongly attracted to the negatively charged DTPA. From the three central nitrogen and five carboxyl oxygen atoms, dative or coordinate covalent bonds start to form between the macromolecule and the metal ion. As these bonds develop, the molecule undergoes a conformational change and basically wraps around and tightly binds to the metal ion like a claw, hence the root word chelae. Notice there are eight coordinate covalent bonds between DTPA and the gadolinium ion. Almost all of the current chelating agents contain eight nodes that are available for dative bonding, leaving one open node. The ninth node allows a weak dative bond to form between the gadolinium ion and water molecule. This bond exchanges frequently and allows multiple water molecules to experience the paramagnetic effect of the gadolinium ion and thus provide the desired T1 shortening effect of the gadolinium contrast agent. The faster these water molecules exchange, the more water molecules affected and the stronger the T1 shortening or relaxivity. 
relaxivity is one of the characteristics of the gadolinium chelates and varies from molecule to molecule. The other major classification of chelating agents is the macrocyclic, which contains a fixed central carbon and nitrogen ring with four limbs. In this example, we again use the negatively charged carboxylate as each of the limbs. Since the central ring is rigid, it does not undergo the dramatic conformational change we see in the linear molecule. However, the four limbs wrap around the gadolinium ion and thus trap the metal in a three-dimensional box-like structure. Again, there are eight binding sites, four nitrogen and four carboxylate, that occupy eight of the gadolinium coordinates, with the water molecule weakly occupying the ninth coordinate. In 2006, nephrologists in Denmark identified a new disease process, now referred to as nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, or NSF, in patients with chronic renal insufficiency who had undergone contrast-enhanced MRI studies in the past. The disease manifests as a diffuse, debilitating tissue fibrosis that, in the most severe form, can be fatal as critical organs like the heart, lungs, and liver become progressively fibrosed and non-functional. The pathogenesis is poorly understood, but felt to be related to the free gadolinium deposition in the tissues. And this makes sense why it would occur most exclusively in patients with renal insufficiency. If the kidneys aren't working, the complex stays longer in the bloodstream, and with time, the gadolinium ion could dissociate from the carrier molecule and deposit in the regional tissues. This also seems to depend on the type of chelating agent utilized. Based on two molecular features, linear versus macrocyclic, and ionic versus non-ionic, a simple four-square chart ranks the relative risk with the highest being the linear non-ionic and the lowest risk with the macrocyclic ionic configuration. Now, we just described the linear and macrocyclic configurations of the chelate, so you should understand that, but what about ionic versus non-ionic? Basically, it all depends on the net charge of the entire chelated molecule. For example, in our linear molecule, there are five negatively charged carboxylate side arms, while the gadolinium cation has a positive charge of three. Therefore, our chelated molecule has a net charge of minus two and would be considered linear ionic. In the macrocyclic example, four negatively charged carboxylate side arms bind to the three positive charges of the gadolinium cation for a net charge of minus one. This would be macrocyclic ionic, the configuration with the lowest theoretic risk of NSF. Going back to our linear chelate, if we change two of our carboxylate sidearms, replacing the oxygen atoms with nitrogens, we still maintain the eight coordinate bonds of the chelate, but this molecule now only has three negative sidearms. Binding to the plus three gadolinium cation, the entire molecular complex is neutral. This chelate is linear and non-ionic, the configuration with the highest theoretic risk of NSF. The risk of NSF has been essentially eliminated because we screen patients for renal failure prior to gadolinium administration. Currently, we no longer give gadolinium contrast agents to patients with severe renal failure defined as a GFR less than 30. However, while gadolinium chelates have been used for decades as an MRI contrast agent with no reported cases of NSF patients with normal renal function, reports out of Japan in 2014 described areas of increased T1 signal within the brain of otherwise normal patients who had undergone multiple contrast-enhanced MRI scans in the past. This example shows the same brain before contrasted exams and after multiple contrasted MRI exams with faint increased signal in an area called the globus pallidus. Over the years, others reported similar findings, but critics felt that there are many benign etiologies for increasing T1 signal in these regions of the brain, and the interval change couldn't definitively be attributed to heavy metal deposition. In addition, the brain, being one of the most important and sensitive organs in our body, lives in a relatively protected environment facilitated through the blood-brain barrier, which prevents many chemicals and molecules circulating throughout the body from entering the brain itself. It was felt that chelated or even the free gadolinium would not be able to cross this protective barrier and therefore gadolinium deposition would be highly unlikely. 
However, in November 2017, McDonald et al. reported on the post-mortem evaluation of brains of individuals who were known to have undergone multiple contrast-enhanced MRI scans of the body during their life. Using transmission electron microscopy and X-ray spectra analysis of electron-dense areas, the researchers found a statistically significant increase in gadolinium deposition in patients with known multiple lifetime exposures to gadolinium contrast over controls, despite the fact that neither group had any detectable brain abnormalities. These findings appear to negate the assumption that gadolinium agents could not cross the intact blood-brain barrier in otherwise normal patients. In 2016, researchers organized the Gadolinium Related Evaluation Consortium, or GREC, in Naples, Italy, to study the possibility of gadolinium deposition disease, or GDD, in otherwise normal individuals. They felt that there may be a subset of patients that have genetic mutations that inhibit their metabolism of heavy metals. Reported symptoms are rather vague and include things like a burning sensation, hair loss, headache, itchy or discolored skin, confusion or mental fog, maybe some diarrhea or possibly vomiting. To date, it is felt that the most reliable exam for determining free gadolinium is the 24-hour urine. While it does not give you the diagnosis of gadolinium deposition disease, it may prompt additional treatment such as a administration of a chelating agent to bind and eliminate any free gadolinium in the body. Bottom line, I personally believe that there is a minuscule but finite amount of gadolinium probably released every time we have some kind of contrasted MRI examination. With trillions and trillions of chelate bound gadolinium ion, a few of them are bound to break through from their carrier molecule and get deposited in the tissues with no real good mechanism to clear them from the body. But just like the FDA allowance of insulin insect parts in your peanut butter, which is about 136 per jar, and the EPA's allowance for lead in drinking water, which is about 15 parts per million, another heavy metal that can't be cleared from the body. In the majority of patients, the minuscule amount of gadolinium that's deposited in the tissues after a gadolinium contrast examination is probably subclinical. However, there may be a subset of patients with a genetic predisposition that may make them more sensitive to the retained gadolinium over the general population. Currently, we administer over 30 million doses of gadolinium contrast agents worldwide, with the vast majority of patients completely asymptomatic. In certain clinical situations, like evaluating for brain tumors or active multiple sclerosis, as well as subtle labral joint injuries, the information obtained from the administration of gadolinium contrast is invaluable for determining the appropriate treatment. However, with the relatively high intrinsic soft tissue contrast and MR imaging, most scans don't even require any extrinsic contrast. In fact, only about 25% of all MRIs require gadolinium administration. In addition, researchers are looking for alternative paramagnetic agents that could be used for MR contrast in the future. The problem is gadolinium does such a great job, it's going to be hard to find a replacement. For now, if you're scheduled for an MRI scan, have your doctor explain why he or she needs IV contrast. If they can't give you a valid explanation, then ask if they can get the necessary information without contrast. And if you do require contrast, make sure the facility uses a macrocyclic, not linear agent, to reduce the risk of gadolinium retention. As always, thanks for watching.